Throughout the entire course of human history, settlements large and small always had an open area where things just happened. The beating heart of the community, the place where people trade, the place where people gathered, the place where people are punished and humiliated. The place of performers and orators, of protest and officialdom. Whether it was in the centre of the settlement or just outside, everywhere needed that focal point, that open heart. In the modern age, most large cities understand the importance of keeping this open place. Some have many and some have few but most treasure it. Some even make it look beautiful, the centerpiece of the city's pride, the part to show off. Either way, those basic ancient functions still occur there. Fireworks, festivals, protests, and pickets. But this is Manchester, and we do things differently here. This is Manchester's largest open space within the city center, this. And this, and this, and this. It's just awful. There are very few trees and no flowers. There's a patch of grass that dies out in hot weather and gets soggy in the rain. And there's plenty of rain. Everything about it flies in the face of a happy community environment. You can't gather here for fun. There are too many obstacles. Knee-high walls, neck-high walls, annoyingly placed statues, a sunken oval shaped water feature which is dangerous to walk on and a path crossing it with a large rail. It's a good place to hang out to deal drugs or indeed to take them but to have a nice community event it's the worst. Recently it's even been taken over by whatever this mishmash of boxes, railings, containers and poorly made walls are supposed to amount to. A temporary outdoor drinking area that's just kind of hanging around like the arse end of late stage capitalist Britain. I suppose it's supposed to be a cool, trendy new place to have a drink in the city. As if what the city needed more of was places to have a drink and not, say, I don't know, places not to have to drink in order to relax and enjoy somewhere. Places that are inspirational, green and tranquil. Every now and again, the council will erect a fence around the gardens to protect the grass from wearing out to limit footfall. Now I don't know if that's the purpose of this particular perimeter of fencing. I mean, when it comes to Piccadilly Gardens, I don't think we'll ever truly know the purpose of things like this. But let me just say that again. To protect the grass from people in a public space where people are supposed to come in numbers. For a city constantly trying to improve itself, the existence of Piccadilly Gardens in its current state is beyond strange. Coming here to feel the spirit of dynamic Manchester is like going to the Titanic Museum in Belfast to feel the spirit of ocean travel. By day, the gardens is a place to walk through without stopping, or somewhere to eat food if you're pressed for time and you're really, really desperate. By night, the gardens is even worse. I mean, it's always nice to have the centerpiece of your city bubble with an aura of overarching danger, of sinister intent. The lighting is horrible, the atmosphere creepy. I mean, it's not exactly the Piazza San Marco, is it? And oh yeah, we've not even mentioned this yet. This, this long, gray, dull, concrete wall. A concrete wall. A concrete wall in the middle of a public square. A concrete wall the authorities are so precious about that we can't even enjoy the benefit of some colourful graffiti art or a nice mural. I mean, if you let loads of teenagers tag it, at least it would have some character. Better than this. And I know what you're thinking. Why is it called Piccadilly Gardens? Where are the f gardens? But there's a danger of looking back with rose-tinted glasses and saying it never used to be this shoddy. But not here, on this cursed bit of land. Manchester started up here, next to the River Irk and Irwell, and spread this way as it grew. As the first industrial city in the world, it spread quickly and it spread without a grand plan. 
Before it reached here, the land that is today Piccadilly Gardens, there were clay pits used for construction. And typical of Britain at the time, such holes of dirty water were ideal places to dunk women for the crimes of not doing what they were told, speaking their mind, questioning male authority, and generally just exercising free will. Such places were common throughout Britain. Women were forced to sit on the end of a long seesaw and then dunked into the freezing cold, rancid water several times, while crowds of onlookers jeered. In the 1700s, the clay pits were replaced by a large hospital called the Royal Infirmary and the Royal Lunatic Asylum. And it stayed that way for a century as the city boomed and went full industrialization. In 1792, a barking dog in a small ornamental pond outside the hospital alerted passers-by to the presence of a body in the water. This was the body of Winifred Hughes, who had decided to fill her pockets with rocks and drown herself after finding out that she was pregnant outside of wedlock. By 1908, both a hospital and asylum had moved out. The Grand Hospital building might have made an ideal library, or a theatre, or an art gallery. Instead, it was razed to the ground. In 1917, conductor Thomas Beecham announced plans to build a grand opera house on the site, as beautiful and important as any other outside Paris or Petrograd. Sadly, Beecham went bankrupt, and the temporary gardens were installed. The reason? Manchester was in desperate need of greenery. All of that rapid growth as the world's first industrial city and meant that nobody had bothered setting aside land for pleasure, for enjoyment. Manchester is a place notorious for being short on parks. It's best being far from the city centre. After thoughts of an era before anyone had considered that an urban environment of stress, hard graft and dark, dangerous streets weren't very good for mental health. Despite common misconceptions, Piccadilly Gardens was never very well designed. This grainy photograph from 1948 shows that all efforts had gone into producing a busy exchange for several wide roads, leaving a small island isolated in the middle. This space over here is where today you'd find Piccadilly Plaza. Seen from another angle, the dedication to roads over people becomes even more apparent. But look how ideal this location was, even 70 years ago, for the development of a true city square that could rival the likes of St. Petersburg or even Trafalgar. This was the real birth of Piccadilly Gardens as a true public space. A sunken gardens of grass and flower beds, benches and deck chairs. A place bathed in sunshine, weather dependent. And for a while it was Manchester's meeting place, its beautiful heart. This is generally agreed by all as Piccadilly's glory days, the golden era. There was nothing grand about this rather commoner garden gardens, but it did its job. By the 1990s, however, this part of Manchester was suffering an identity crisis. The large modernist Piccadilly Plaza, which already divided opinion, had been neglected. Worse was the fact that what had once been a temporary place to park cars was now a major bus station, taking up a large area and sucking the charm out of the space. Its existence also meant that those retail units at the foot of Piccadilly Plaza struggled to attract any but the most bottom of the market outlets. Despite this land being given to the city hundreds of years ago on the provision that it would always be used as a public space, Manchester City Council sold this chunk here to a developer. This at least could have been a chance to show the world Manchester's ambition to produce attractive, innovative architecture. Instead, the office building here looks like a multi-storey car park that was sketched on a napkin five minutes before the deadline to submit a design. Apologies to the architects behind it, who no doubt put in weeks of effort designing this thing. But seriously, this is a city square have a bit of imagination. And finally, a large part of the gardens was also sacrificed for the tram lines, which not only occupied a hefty swathe of land, but also means that leaving in this direction on foot is both dangerous and unfriendly for pedestrians. 
Small efforts have been made to make better use of the square. You'll notice that these days, Mosley Street here is only used by trams. So the whole square is now a lot cleaner, quieter and safer. Despite this, it's also now a lot smaller too. This satellite photo was taken in the year 2000, just before the latest transformation took place. The yellow area highlighted is the entire size of the square, not including roads or tram lines. While the green area is the area that was actually green. Now compare that to a photo from 2021. Both the green area and the overall pedestrian size of the square have shrunk enormously. Now we British love a good moan about things, but that's not what this video is about. Listing its major design problems, the busy roads, the buses, the trams, the concrete wall, the fountains, the lack of greenery and the building here, we can start to see that Piccadilly Gardens in its present state does need a little bit of defending. Firstly, the roads have been scaled back and the area now largely pedestrianised. Secondly, the city centre does need somewhere for all of its buses to go and Piccadilly Gardens is the ideal location. Thirdly, the tram lines have no choice but to come this way and take up all of this room. If you want a tram stop in the square, which you do, then this is the only place for it to go. And it's next to the buses, which makes a useful interchange. Now it'd be nice to be able to cross here as a pedestrian without feeling like you're about to be squished from multiple angles. But what other solutions are there? Fourthly, as bland and depressing as this concrete wall is, it does slightly provide a definitive barrier between the transport hub and the grassy area, which tempers the volume slightly and also prevents people walking willy-nilly in all directions. Fifthly, when the fountains are on and working and don't smell like old slime, they are actually quite pleasant. Quite and pleasant being about the level of enthusiasm one can muster. Sixthly, the lack of greenery is, well, yeah, that's indefensible. And the building, well, what else did we expect? Classically beautiful buildings don't get built in Britain anymore. And gone are the days when architectural merit came before cost. Piccadilly Non Gardens is a giant wasted opportunity. Potentially, it could be so much more. The footfall here is high and the area large. Its potential to be a real functional gathering place is huge. Studies show again and again that green spaces lush with plant life are good for mental health and physical health. One of the single biggest, cheapest and easiest things a city can do to improve public health is plant a diverse range of trees in lots of places. The colour green has a lasting subtle effect on a person's mood. There's a reason people go forest bathing for a hobby and not multi-storey car park bathing. And Manchester has always struggled for places for the public to gather in large crowds. Some public squares are too small to make it practical, while others are too out of the way to be meaningful. Albert Square outside the Town Hall is large, but even this is so far removed from the busiest parts of the city that it feels like a strange place to gather. Piccadilly, however, would be the ideal city square. It's the largest open area in the city. It's where most people are concentrated, shoppers, workers and tourists. It could be a green oasis that welcomes music, public speaking and market stalls. It could be the place people gather for fireworks and parades. And I know some people will find this beautiful, like all things are beautiful in their own way. And despite how gross this all is, it's now part of Manchester's story, so we should appreciate it while it's here. And I know many of you will be rolling your eyes right now and saying, Ollie, you lovable old fool, you're confusing a public gardens with a public square, and that the two are very different. But what I'm saying is that it's possible to have both in one place, that Manchester is crying out for both, and Piccadilly is trying to dodge being either. This is a new public square built in Cleveland, Ohio, just a few years ago. It promotes people flow and it has an official speaker's platform for the gathering of crowds and the functioning of a healthy democracy. It has plenty of room for those crowds too, with no stupid street furniture placements. 
It even has the regular things like fountains and statues, one of which is huge. It's still surrounded by roads. Hell, it even has a road running straight through it. But for festivals, events, parades and protests, these roads become overspill areas to keep the crowds safe. And yeah, it's pretty damn green as well. And now let's return to Piccadilly Gardens. It's neither functional nor elegant. It's neither a pleasant gardens nor does it meet the most basic needs of a city square. Is this really the best Manchester has to offer? A city of great scientific minds, radical politics, revolutionary music and sporting glory. We're a city that's always punched above its weight. How can such a place be happy vomiting up the least imaginative square anyone could think of? And yet we all know what's going to happen, don't we? Another innovative design will come along, prioritising retail spaces that nobody will ever want. It'll create a transient place that invites people carrying takeaways and people cutting through, but will ignore the whole reason a gardens is needed in the first place. Community. Collectivism. But like that unimaginative boss you have at work, a lot of people will be saying, don't just bring me problems, bring me solutions. So for anyone dreaming of what a city of the future should look like, and hoping to create a Piccadilly Gardens which invites gatherings, social cohesion, intelligent debate, that sense of peace, tranquility, escapism, and a heart of a city they can be proud to call their own, I've got one hint to give you. It's a gardens. Plant some f***ing trees. <laughs>